Hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Consortium for IT Software Quality. Uh, my name is Tracy Berardi, I'm Program Manager of CISC. As a greater portion of mission, business, and safety critical functionality is committed to software intensive systems, these systems become one of the largest sources of risk to enterprises and their customers. And it's executives that are ultimately responsible for managing this risk, and they need guidance for communicating their expectations and developing policy to ensure the business or mission is enabled by trustworthy systems. To address this need, CISC has launched a trustworthy systems manifesto uh, that we've developed and, and are committed to, to maintaining. And CISC is a standards consortium that's managed by the Object Management Group. Uh, and we're chartered to advance the trustworthiness of software intensive systems by producing standards for automating the measurement of size and structural quality from, from source code. And we conduct outreach activities uh, to spread measures and techniques for improving the trustworthiness of software intensive systems. Uh, so the speaker today is Dr. Bill Curtis, the Executive Director of CISC. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Curtis to get started. Uh, looks like some people are still still hopping on the GoToWebinar, um, and we're glad you could you could join us today. Um, we will have some time at the end of the presentation uh, for Q&A, uh, and you can submit your questions at any time. There's a, a questions tab here in the, the GoToWebinar toolbar. Uh, there's also a handouts tab where you can download uh, a copy of the presentation. Um, and with that, Bill, I'm going to give you presenter control so you can share your Share your screen. Okay, is it? Can you see it? So let's see. You, you should now um, be able to accept presenter control. Okay. Is it? Did you? Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, and welcome to the webinar. Welcome. From from Fort Worth. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview first of CISC and why it decided that having this kind of a manifesto was critical. And then I'm going to give you a, an overview of the manifesto, its points, uh, what's behind it, and how we would like to see this get used uh, in terms of developing policy. Uh, we are, why didn't this work? Okay. There we go. We're in the area of nine-digit glitches. Uh, nine digits not being bits or bytes, but being dollars and euros. Uh, the famous one was Capital Night Trading, which was an online high-speed stock trading organization. Uh, they had an update to their software that, for some reason, accessed some dead code uh, and pulled out an old trading algorithm that was out of date, and within 30 minutes, it had made $440 million worth of bad trades and they were bankrupt. Uh, so that's, you know, this, this, these, these kinds of problems now are entering a domain that destroys the, certainly the quarterly statement, if not, uh, sometimes can put companies close to bankruptcy. Uh, the London Stock Exchange uh, has been crippled several times by system outages. Not to be outdone, year, several years ago, the Royal Bank of Scotland had an update that uh, when it didn't work well, it was backed out and they wiped out customer records and 20 some odd million Brits were unable to get to their bank accounts uh, for several weeks. And we see now in, in Great Britain, banks seem to be going out almost every week having some kind of an outage or problem. Not to be outdone, the airline industry has decided to have its own uh, large-scale outages. United's had one. They were outdone by Delta. Uh, it's now had one three years in a row. The last one estimated to cost about $140 million as people were unable to get on planes and they had to cancel flights for over a day. Uh, a lot of you know about the Target problem where 40 million credit cards were stolen. Uh, the CIO was fired from her job, and two weeks later, the CEO was fired. Uh, and then the famous Equifax hack recently that they're estimating may go as far as over $600 million because of the enormous amount of financial information on, on millions and millions of people who were in that, uh, that database. It was simply a, a vulnerability in a piece of open source software that hadn't been patched that a hacker found, got in, and started pulling out uh, all the customer records. Uh, here's a, an estimate by, by Gartner. 
uh, that we're going to see roughly on average $5,600 per minute when these, these big outages happen. That goes to over $300,000 an hour. But if this is a major retail system in a huge company, it could easily be over a million dollars an hour. Uh, so that's how these things begin mounting up and heading towards nine digit glitches. Uh, IT downtime is estimated to cost $26.5 billion. That was an article in Information Week. Uh, CA Technologies making that, that estimate. Uh, Cybercrime costs projected to go over $2 trillion next year. Uh, you know, Jenny Romney, head of IBM, said that this is probably the greatest threat to almost every company, is the potential for cybercrime to steal uh, financial information, to steal trade secrets, uh, and what have you. Uh, and a recent study by Herb Krasner, uh, funded by CA Technologies, uh, that's now a report on the CIS website, estimated the cost of poor software in the U.S. alone could hit over $2 trillion. Now, how do you get to that kind of a crazy number? Uh, you've got the cost of outages. You've got the cost of security breaches. You've got the damage it does. In addition, you've got the cost of fixing all this stuff. You've got the cost of, you know, programmers being slowed in their work for, for years sometimes uh, because of legacy software and its complexity and the difficulty of working with it. So by the time you start adding all these costs up, the cost of bad software is, uh, is massive. And uh, for companies, it can be nine digits. For a country, it can be far, far more than that. So who has responsibility for this? When we're looking at these nine-digit glitches, it's no longer the CIO. We're really looking at the senior executives of the corporation that own the problem. Uh, the Wall Street Journal does not call the CIO when there's a major outage. Uh, they call the CEO. And the board of directors has to get involved because of the damage to the organization and how it gets how it gets handled and the cost of the quarterly statement. Uh, executives responsible for government, risk management, the continuity of the business, product liability, uh, all kinds of issues. So this is now far more than an IT issue, especially now that uh, most of the business is being committed to digitization. So we're seeing this modern, this massive modernization, and there's tremendous risk if the systems aren't trustworthy. So what do executives need? One of the things they need is a way to evaluate system risk, and they need measures of the systems themselves that can tell them what kind of risk they're facing when these systems go online, and they commit the business or the mission uh, to the systems. CISC was formed back in 2010, uh, originally because a number of, of system integrators were seeing uh, basically these numbers being written into their contracts as the equivalent of service level agreements for things like security and reliability and maintainability. Uh, and every customer had a different definition of what they meant by reliability or security. And they said, look, we need some international standards. They came to OMG and a few of them went to SEI and said, can you help us? Can you help us get some international standards that we can use in these contracts to get the lawyers out of it and get a common language and a common set of agreements on how we're going to measure the quality of what we're delivering. So Paul Nielsen, who heads SEI, and Richard Soley, who heads OMG, uh, got together and said, let's form a consortium to develop these standards. Since I've worked with both organizations, they asked me to be the executive director. And we launched this with a number of companies involved in uh, helping to develop the initial, the initial uh, standards. Uh, we have some, now we have sponsors that sponsor the work, and these are, uh, here you see at the top, a list of the current sponsors that sponsor our website, our business manager, and a number of other uh, positions. We've actually just today added one more, the Department of Computer Science and the Engineering School at the University of Southern California uh, has joined. That's the, the leadership of Dr. Barry Beam has joined as a CISC sponsor. We also have partners we work with. We sort of cross-advertise our various conferences. We share them Information. We we work with each other to try to drive forward this uh, this concept of trustworthy systems and more responsible, more effective IT, more effective uh, product engineering. When we formed CISC in 2010, <clears throat> we held executive forums in Washington D.C., Frankfurt, Germany, and Bangalore, India, and we invited executives and asked them if we undertook the consortium. What measures would you want us to start with? What would be our first round of measures? And you can see on the screen the five measures they prioritized. We went through a voting uh, process, and these were the five that emerged. They wanted a size measure 
for automating function points as close to the if plug guidelines of the International Function Point Users Group's counting guidelines as we could get them. They also wanted structural quality measures for reliability, performance efficiency, security, and maintainability. Well, we went through the first round and completed those. Function points was the, was the first measure that we had a standard for. The other four we developed from known weaknesses in software uh, that you can detect through static analysis and we can measure those and by doing that we get a measure of the quality of the software in each of these domains but that also gives us a measure of the risk of the software so the more of these weaknesses that we detect the more riskier that software is to the business so those have now gone through the omg standards process standards development process they are approved standards of the omg uh, we now have seven standards we have one for technical debt that'll be that'll be placed on the website shortly we have lots of deployment workshops we hold uh, twice a year we've been holding cyber security or cyber resilience forums in Washington, D.C. to get the federal government involved in helping adopt these standards and share best practices for improving the trustworthiness of systems. And in addition, we started moving some of these over to ISO. For instance, we have submitted the automated function point standard to ISO for their consideration for adoption. <clears throat> so it's a very active program of building standards for measuring the size and the structural quality of software. Uh, and now we're moving into this deployment phase where we want to help people start using these in their, in their shops, in their contracts, and their ability to uh, assess the risk and the trustworthiness of their various systems and products. Uh, and so in deploying these, uh, you know, they're now OMG standards. Uh, We've sim starting submitting them to ISO, but we've also started trying to work with first getting these into federal policy. We've met with a number of federal agencies. Uh, we invite them to our cyber resilience forums, and we had over 200 people to the last one. A lot of very senior folks from a number of the federal agencies, the U.S. government. Uh, we've held one of these in Brussels to hopefully uh, get involved with the European Union and NATO. Uh, we held one in India just two weeks ago in Bangalore, eventually in the future will hold one in Delhi uh, to work with the Indian government. But the goal is to get these, uh, these measures used in regulations and used in contracting and system acquisition. Uh, in fact, they've been referenced in several regulations. We've produced an awful lot of comments uh, when various agencies asked for comments on regulations they're proposing. Uh, we've had them listed in, in several recent contracts from the U.S. State Department, from the General Services Administration. The state of Texas has just passed a law uh, that came into effect this year requiring or requiring acquisitions over a million dollars or over a year in duration to report measures of progress and quality and so we're we've been talking with them about the CIS measures as one possibility for evaluating the trustworthiness of the uh, of the systems being delivered to the state so this is a very active uh, very active activity right now and as well we're talking with vendor managers and quality managers and auditors and others involved in corporations uh, to get these used in corporations both for assessing risk uh, for developing contracts for measuring internal uh, internal quality and trustworthiness of systems so this is a very active part of what CISC is working to do now we're continuing on with our work on the standards uh, we were now revising these quality standards as we did we found additional concerns and weaknesses that need to be represented and counted in the assessing risk of software intensive systems. So this is a very active area of work for us, uh, both in terms of development and deployment. Now, in deploying these and in talking with lots of folks in corporations, we started getting lots of complaints about the growth of technical debt in their systems and their fear about the untrustworthiness, the lack of trustworthiness in the systems they're deploying. They're, they're very concerned about quality. And one of the things we kept hearing is, look, th these developers in many cases are telling us they're using agile methods, but when we look closely, frankly, they're just hacking. They're not using the discipline of the method. They're just using that as an excuse to kind of do what they want in a sense, uh, certainly not do discipline development. In fact, several years ago, I was at the Agile Alliance Conference and participating in a session led by uh, Sutherland, uh, who is one of the creators of the Scrum Method. And he said 
that frankly, 70% of the corporations he visits and consults with are doing what he calls scrum butt. You know what scrum butt is, right? We're doing scrum, but we don't do daily deals, but we don't do daily stand-ups, but we don't, okay, you're not doing scrum. Uh, and that's the, that's the problem, is that so many are claiming they're doing a method, but they're not really doing it. They don't have the discipline. And that results in growing amounts of technical debt and uh, growing fear in the quality of the software, the riskiness, and the untrustworthiness of what they're basically putting the corporation on top of. Uh, so based on that, we looked at the various manifestos that are out there, the, the Agile manifesto being the most famous. And, you know, I, there are some things here that, that concern me. These are really written by developers for developers in most cases. You don't see a lot of executive influence in these. They don't really represent the interests of the enterprise, of the, of the public agency or of the corporation. Look at the first principle there, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Well, the truth of the matter is you can't do effective agile development without tools. You certainly can't do DevOps without a, an integrated tool chain. Uh, so the fact is, you know, th that tool chain is just as important. Uh, because that's how we're going to industrialize software. It'll improve the quality, it'll improve the productivity. It'll actually free developers to spend more of their time on the actual challenging intellectual work rather than worrying about getting every, all the little details right so I can get this thing rolled out into, into operations or into QA. Uh, so the fact is this is focused so heavily on developers, you don't see a lot of wording in here that talks about the, the quality or trustworthiness of the software. It's really about more about the developers and how they work and how they want to work. Now, it was followed with a rugged manifesto. Uh, I'm rugged, and more importantly, my code is rugged. Well, this the rugged manifesto at least began talking about the product itself, the code, the software, uh, the software that was being delivered, but you still see the word I at the beginning of every, every one of these. I am rugged because I refuse to be a source of vulnerability. And I, I'm going to be a linebacker when I grow up or something. I mean, the bottom line is was very much focused on the individual, and that's good. I'm glad that people want to commit to being better in the work they're doing and develop, you know, defensible code, uh, high quality code. But the fact is this still doesn't represent what the enterprise needs to ensure it has trustworthy systems. And so that led us to think quite a bit at CISC about what we really need in terms of a, a manifesto that represents the organization's interest, the, the agency or the corporation's interest in having trustworthy systems. If we're going to digitize the organization and put all of our business and mission critical functions into software. Now, here, here's one of the big problems we've got that we're facing when, when we develop these, these huge systems. Uh, and that's it's a technology stack. Now, I'm a developer. I, I claim I'm the best computer scientist my university ever produced. I build my components. I run them through some freeware I got off the net to make sure they're elegant and beautiful. I submit them to the build and feel like I've, I've, I've done a great job and I've done my work. Problem is that my my components go into a build with an awful lot of other components, probably written in the same language, right? So, you know, if this is all the business logic, it's written in Java or .NET or C++ or some other language. Uh, and now it gets more complex because these things are being integrated from lots of different people. In may, many cases, lots of different teams. There's lots of different concerns. There's lots of different assumptions going on. Uh, and this is a bit more than uh, than I can can detect uh, with uh, problems with my little freeware off the net. It's going to take something a little bit more powerful. But this isn't the big problem. The big problem is that any modern application uh, is a stack of technologies. It's an integration of, you know, a user interface that's written in JSP or ASP, business logic and Java, .NET, C++, Python, whatever. Frameworks like Frame or uh, Spring or Hibernate. There's SQL queries in here. If you're a bank, this is interacting with some ancient COBOL system that's not documented, and the guy that built it is dead. And uh, and there's some database down at the bottom holding the data, and I may know more or less about that database. So the truth of the matter is no single developer can understand all of this. I mean, even the smartest developers don't know uh, all of these languages, all of the concerns, all of the architectural decisions made in creating this kind of an application. In fact, no single team can know it all. They have to make assumptions. And the truth of the matter is to work in this kind of our environment, you need help to reduce the complexity so you can, you can make better assumptions and better understand how your components are going to interact with the entire system. As 
we move into the internet of things, this picture gets even more complex because I've got embedded devices interacting with information systems, some of which I know about, some of which are out there and I don't know a whole lot about them. And so we need to make sure that as we build interfaces for these, we, we protect the critical, the critical trustworthiness interests uh, of the organization. Uh, because we're basically betting the farm on these. We're committing the business and the future of the business uh, to these systems. So here's the problem and why we need a manifesto that really focuses on the organization's needs, the, what the executives need. They, they own the risk because they're the ones that are going to have to answer to the public, to the stockholders uh, for things that happen, whether it's an outage or a, uh, a serious problem with an embedded device or what have you. Uh, but they're not tech experts in most cases. As we get to a younger generation of executives, yes, most of them at some point have written some kind of code, but they're still not necessarily technical experts in all these, these, these wide technologies being integrated together. So they need help, they need guidance, uh, and they need to understand what kind of policies they need to, play, to put in place to reduce the risk to the organization of software intensive systems and of problems in software intensive systems. And they need to know what kind of dialogues they need to hold with IT or engineering uh, to ensure that we're not putting the organization at excessive risk in the IT systems or in the software intensive products that we're building. So the problem with the existing manifesto, they're focused on individuals primarily and teams sometimes, but not organizations. Uh, and we really need the executives have to focus on the organizational issues and committing the organization to, to new products and new uh, modernization and digitization. They underemphasize in many cases, quality and operational risk. They talk about it, but not in terms that, that the trustworthiness is a critical issue. Uh, they're often more about coding than about the principles of software engineering, both the software engineering process as well as software engineering and architectural and coding principles. Uh, they fail to represent management's responsibilities. They basically have been written from the perspective of developers. That's good. Developers need guidance on how to become a more professional developer, but we also need guidance on how to create an organization and reduce the risk uh, from the systems that it's deploying. Uh, and finally, it didn't necessarily create a dialogue among responsible parties across the organization between executives and IT and products and QA and, and the audit folks and what have you. We need those dialogues in order to fully accept the responsibility of the organization for governing the risk that these systems present to the organization. So this is the Trustworthy System Manifesto. It's just five principles. We, we started with an awful long list and then really abstracted it down uh, to these basic five issues. I'm gonna talk about each one of these and the ideas and concepts behind them and why they're important. Let's start with the first one. Engineering discipline in process and product. Both process and product, not one or the other, uh, but both. The first being that the principles and practices of software engineering have to predominate if we're going to reduce the risk of the systems and trust that these systems are worthy of running the business or being placed in our customers' environments, uh, then we have to we have to really be serious about the software engineering. This is not the same as product engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. We know that uh, this is an intellectual artifact. It is different. It has different principles. Uh, but the fact is, we have to we have to accept that there are principles of software engineering that we know about, uh, both in terms of the process and the product that need to be adhered to. Frankly, you can run a pure agile product and still adhere to all the good practices of software engineering. They are are not, uh, they are not at odds with each other. They just need to be integrated effectively so that we don't put the business at risk. Uh, second, trustworthy, trustworthy systems don't emerge from haphazard development deployment processes. Uh, we, have, we have data, in fact, a lot of data now that shows that uh, immature organizations produce poor software, structurally unsound software. We, we've replicated this result a number of times. It, organizations that have at least gotten to level two in terms of CMM, CMMI, do produce structurally better code because you've gotten all the chaos out of the world and you allow the developers to start acting more professionally. They want to be professional. They want to act professional. If you give them uh, if you give them commitments they can't meet, uh, they start having to run 
wild, working nights and weekends, living on carryout pizza and jolt cola to try to meet nutty deadlines. Once you remove that kind of chaos from their life, they can act more professionally and they clearly produce far superior software. Uh, third, the shorter the time scale, the greater need for process discipline. This is not a software thing. This is almost any era area of human endeavor. The shorter the time scale you have to execute something in, the more critical it is that you have a disciplined process. Why? Because you don't have time to figure out how to do it. You need to be able to execute rapidly, and you need to be able to execute with high quality work or high quality production, uh, whatever it is. You don't have a lot of time to be fixing mistakes. So the shorter we make the time scales for these uh, these iterations the more discipline we need in the process if you're going to use scrum then use scrum don't do scrum but uh, we need with we do need discipline in the process in the way we execute the shorter we make these time scales uh, in which we're delivering software intensive systems uh, developers and operators number four must be supplemented by automated technologies that can reduce complexity and improve visibility in the systems and operations. The systems are simply too big. These are you know, multi-million line systems, uh, multiple technologies and technology stacks interacting with other systems when you get into the, the internet of things. And, and the truth of the matter is, developers and development teams need help in reducing the complexity so they understand how their decisions uh, how their implementation capabilities are going to be integrated with other components of the system so that you don't create weaknesses uh, and to improve their visibility into what's actually happening both in the development and the operation of the system and finally organizations have a responsibility and this is on the organization side to ensure that the developers have the knowledge and skills they need to build and deploy search for these systems if if i'm going to employ people to build these systems i need to accept responsibility for making sure they're prepared to do the work i've assigned them uh, and and that becomes fairly critical that's why we invest in training budgets it's why we have mentors and, and other things that help build uh, critical skills and critical experience in in these systems so that's the first principle engineering discipline in product and process the goal is to help developers do more professional work and take greater pride in developing the systems they develop but it is done in a way that helps the organization reduce the risk of those systems Second principle, quality assurance to risk tolerance thresholds. And that, the notion of risk tolerance thresholds is critical here. Uh, executives have to determine what those risks are, what, what we can tolerate. For instance, in telecommunications, most telecom uh, companies uh, have a threshold for the amount of downtime they'll allow in a period of operation, right? And they'll, you know, they'll, pay, the, they'll pay their developers or their, their suppliers to deliver systems that can operate at that threshold, but they won't pay them to go beyond that threshold. You know, they, they, the fact that you get much, much better, they, you know, they're gonna pay what they're gonna pay. However, there are liquidated damages if you fail to achieve the threshold, if you have a lot more downtime than was allowed in the contract. So these are critical issues, and this is true of almost any system. We know it's virtually impossible to create defect-free software, especially at the level of complexity we're building systems now. So the fact is we need to determine what level of risk we can tolerate uh, and then how determine how we're going to meet it. So quality assurance then has to ensure the system operates within the thresholds that the business has set for those, thrists, those systems. How much risk can they accept for outages, for security breaches, for uh, system failure and what have you. And based on that, and it will take time, QA has to start uh, identifying what levels of performance in the, the testing and various assurance activities tell us that we will operate within the risk tolerance threshold. It'll take time to build that data up so we can know, you know, based on the results we're seeing as we go through our static analyses, dynamic analyses, functional tests, penetration tests, and what have you, that we are achieving these risk tolerance thresholds. Uh, but the goal is to get there so we know that that is happening. Uh, and then executives need to establish a policy 
that we will in fact have evidence that we can we can work at those thresholds when we're releasing these into operation. This protects the organization. It says, look, we understand we, we there's always going to be a risk of an outage or a breach or some other problem. But the fact is we are doing the best we can at the at the state of the art, at the state of the profession uh, to protect these systems and to reduce the risk to our customers and to our operations. Uh, so they need to know that they 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 there is evidence uh, that they they are in fact doing what they're supposed to do to achieve these risk tolerance thresholds in the systems they're deploying. Finally, they, they and this is an executive responsibility, they have to enforce the time that's devoted to remediating high priority defects. Uh, and this means refactoring of the system to get technical debt out. It means fixing high severity weaknesses that we know present a severe risk to the system. Uh, and developers can't enforce this time. Uh, there really has this has to be a policy because you always have the business coming to IT or to engineering saying, hey, here's all the new bells and whistles we need, and we need them tomorrow morning. You've got to do this. You have to add this into your sprints or your development cycle or whatever. And the fact is, if you say no, we've got to spend time, you know, remediating some technical debt or fixing some defects, they're going to go up to the up to the CIO and say, you know, your teams aren't being responsive. Uh, and then the CIO is going to come down and say, you need to be responsive to the business. And now you're you're basically doing lots of development and no remediation of serious problems. So that needs to be an executive policy. So the organization knows that the only way we can sustain a trustworthy system is to spend time removing technical debt and remediating high priority defects that present severe risk to the system and to the customers or users uh, of that system or to the organization that's depending on its operation. Uh, and that really has to be a matter of policy and it has to be enforced by the executive so they understand why they have to balance new work with the fact that they have to sustain the capability of the existing systems. Number three, traceable properties of system components. The fact is that all modern software intensive systems or virtually all modern systems are built from a supply chain of component sources. You're incorporating open source. You've got things you've acquired from your vendors and your outsourcers and your system integrators. Uh, you've got things that are built in in-house, in things that are built uh, onshore, offshore. They're coming from all kinds of places and being integrated into this system. So the first thing we have to accept is we are now managing a supply chain and we need to adopt good, strong supply chain management practices for accepting these components into our IT or software intensive system the same way we would manage that if we were taking hardware components into a product that we're going to deliver into the market. Uh, what we need then is something like a bill of materials, a software bill of materials, uh, which gives us evidence of the provenance and trustworthiness that exists with the various components that we're integrating and these need to be a part of what moves along with various bodies of open source software or other components they need to be shared across the supply chain so we know that the components are you know they're authentic they're original if they've been changed we know who changed them what was done to them uh, we we know what vulnerabilities may exist in those systems uh, what changes may have been made etc that we need to understand that to accept the risk of these components that we're we're bringing in from other sources. The uh, Department of Commerce now has a major effort underway to try to come up with a standard for what a bill of materials would look like. And so that uh, becomes a very important uh, initiative to sort of help you know, organizations as well as governments think about uh, what providence means and what we ought to have to understand what the risks are with components that we're acquiring from other sources. Uh, fourth, and this is obvious, right? Proactive defense of the system and its data. Uh, number one, we need to protect the system and its data from malicious actors. And given the fact that these are now multi-technology stacks, technology stacks, we have to deal with several layers of defense. We've got hardware that has to be protected. We've got software. We need to protect the perimeter of the system. We need to protect the software itself uh, against people breaking into weaknesses. We need to patch the vulnerabilities. Uh, we even know that uh, the only safe assumption, actually Bobby Stinsley is now head of the SEI's uh, computer emergency response team, which he was over at the Department of Homeland Security, was on a panel at one of our cyber resilience summits and said, frankly, the only safe assumption you can make 
is that they've already they're already in your system. They've already found a way to get in, and they're existing inside your system. The question you have to ask is how are you going to protect the data? What are you going to do to keep them from getting to the most sensitive, confidential, uh, private data you've got, and then swipe sweeping that out of the system? So you need to continuously monitor and protect the most sensitive parts of, of your system and, and the data that's in the system and track what's happening, monitor what's happening within the system so that you can identify suspicious actions and you can identify suspicious data movements because th these guys are smart. They're not going to take all the data out in one big go. They're going to take it out in small pieces over a long period of time. Uh, and you need to patch and track known vulnerabilities. I mean, this was the Equifax hack uh, that put them in such such uh, compromised state was the fact that they there was a known vulnerability in a piece of open source software that was incorporated in one of their systems. They didn't patch it in time. It was too late. The hackers were already in and pulling data out of the system. So that becomes that just becomes an obvious thing that needs to be done. And those, you know, the the common vulnerability enumeration is out there. You can subscribe to it and get uh, get constant information on. On new vulnerabilities that are being detected and the patches that will close them. Uh, finally, security practices must cover the behavior of authorized system users uh, to ensure that these defenses aren't circumvented. Uh, you know, the fact is, if you have one of these policies that you have to change the your ever password every three months it has to have all these bizarre characters it can't be one you've used in the last 20 passwords what are people going to do they're going to write it down on a piece of paper and every once in a while they're going to forget and leave it out on their desk which is a very fast way to see a system get compromised uh, so the fact is we need to constantly monitor even the behavior of authorized users to see if they've in some way been compromised and someone's breaking into the system uh, so these are just some basic practices. We all know these. They, we've been talking about it for years. But the fact is we still see people uh, violate these practices and, and leave the system open to malicious behavior. And finally, resilient and safe operations. Number one, uh, to sustain the business mission or mission, systems have to be able to continue operations in the face of unexpected events or, if interrupted, recover fairly, efficient, fairly efficiently. Uh, based on the number of outages in British banks, the, their financial conduct authority of the British government uh, put out some possible regulations uh, asked for comments. The regulations dealt with the speed of recovery of the systems, and CIS put in some comments uh, to that, saying, look, the, the, the first problem is not time to recover. The first problem is the fact that it, that it could be, that it could fail in the first place. And this is an issue of design and, and quality assurance, and you need to make sure these systems are as fail-safe, uh, as resilient as possible when you put them into operation. That's a matter of, of the engineering design and quality assurance of the system. Um, but we want to, so we want to make sure that we're putting in place trustworthy software, trustworthy systems. Uh, number two, we want to make sure that they do have fail-safe properties. It means that you fail back to some state that continues to operate, although maybe not the full capability of the system, it still isn't closed down. Uh, and frank, frankly, by the way, a lot of the weaknesses that will cause a system to fail are also weaknesses that hackers exploit to break into the system. There's a very high correlation between the reliability of a system and the security of the system. We, we've got lots of data now that shows that that's a, that's a very strong correlation. So there's what do we mean by trustworthiness? Let's get a, a good definition. Uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the U.S., uh, the, the Industrial Internet Consortium that's managed by OMG uh, and JTC1 SC41 of, uh, of ISO IEC are now working on and have put together basically a definition of the properties that you would want to see in a trustworthy system. You can see the five properties here from safety down to privacy. And in fact, we worked independently. We weren't, we weren't tracking that work uh, at the time we built the manifesto, but the fact is the manifesto covers all five of those issues. And at least one, if not in many cases, several 
of the uh, several of the principles, and all of these five are indirectly related to that first principle of engineering discipline and process and product. Uh, but we're very, we track very well the trustworthiness manifesto with this emerging definition of trustworthiness that IIC and and ISO are beginning to adopt. So we uh, we look forward to to working with them. We've opened a conversation with the the IIC. Uh, to see how we can jointly uh, address these issues. And in addition, uh, Siemens has led an effort in Europe, and this is now spreading to the US. They have some US companies involved, IBM and Dell and, and Cisco and some others, to create a charter of trust. And this is really written at, at more the national level. Uh, what do we have to do, both as organizations and as nations, to ensure the cybersecurity of our systems, that our systems are trustable, uh, trustworthy, and uh, we've we've opened a conversation with them. We're looking forward to some future cooperation in how the manifesto can help uh, it can help the Charter of Trust and help identify principles that are required to support some of these uh, principles inside the Charter of Trust. So. How do we want the manifesto to be used? Frankly, we want it used, uh, and the way it should be used is to create dialogue. These are these are five principles that need to be a source of dialogue between the senior executive team of the organization that owns the responsibility for managing and governing the risk, and the various organizations uh, under their under their responsibility that in fact deal with the, the, the actual actions that create or reduce risk. Uh, you know, the management team from the CIO and the CISO and vendor managers and, and the folks that actually do the technical work, the developers, the QA folks, operation folks, even the corporate auditor uh, needs to be involved because they need to know to what to look for when they're trying to audit the risk to the organization. Uh, so we need the executive team to begin thinking about risk thresholds. What can the business tolerate? Uh, express business needs. What are the conditions with what we have to meet as a business uh, that would affect our development of software intensive systems uh, that we need to to provide trustworthy systems for, and basically establish the policies uh, in cooperation with the folks that have to do or manage the work uh, to govern it so that th they're protected. Frankly, we want to protect the development organization, the various management groups that have to deal with this so that they're working within the organization's policy when they put in place practices that they know they need to protect to produce trustworthy systems. So finally, we want you to sign the manifesto, at least go read it. Uh, if you agree with it, uh, the manifesto is here on the CISC website. Uh, you can go access it. You can get a copy of it, uh, read the manifesto, see what kind of, uh, there, there's a description of each of the principles behind it. Uh, you can review who the signatories are. There's a growing number of people that are signing it, and we encourage you to sign it as well. Uh, because the more the more folks we get behind this, the more we can move this out. I mean, the important thing for you to do after signing it is really to use it as a way to create dialogue with folks in your organization. So here's the CISC website. I encourage you to go to it and to join it. Membership's free. Our sponsors basically provide the funds to run the organization. Uh, so you can join as a member. You can see the member button below the nice lady there. Click it. We'll ask you some questions. Tracy will send you a password, and you can get in our standard are here. There's blogs about how to use the standards. There's presentations from all of our Cyber Resilience Summit. Uh, there's a number of other uh, blogs and other things inside there about the structural quality of software. We've had over 2,000 people join to date, and you can see the companies that they're from, these individual members, uh, from, you know, basically the top you know, Fortune 200 companies and, and beyond. So uh, we encourage you to become a member of the CIS community and help us improve the trustworthiness of systems that are in operation. So with that, let me uh, stop here and open the floor for questions. Tracy, I'll turn it back to you to basically Thanks. run the questions if I can get this up. Yeah, yeah, and please uh, enter your questions now if you, if you have some. But we just have a couple of um, general comments here saying a good session, good job, yes, on the same page. <laughs> um, so no questions just yet, but we'll give people a, a moment. Um, and I'll mention too, yeah, if you go to the CISC homepage, it-cisc.org, uh, our main banner there is, is for the manifesto. If you click that, it'll bring you right to that page um, where you can download the, the document, sign it, view other signatories. 
Uh, okay, here's the first question. Uh, is it possible to determine the CISC measures, maintainability, for example, with open source software? Um, I think it's a question about the tool support for the CISC measures. Yeah, the tool support. Yeah, the, there are companies that are implementing uh, that are implementing this in their tools. Two of our sponsors, Synopsys and Cast, are both implementing the CISC measures. Uh, and as we go along, they'll get more and more of the weaknesses. Uh, you know, there's a lot of weaknesses in these measures, and uh, they're adding those into their their group of weaknesses that they detect. So there are, uh, at least we know those two are, have committed to uh, basically support the CIS measures. You can use them on open source software because it's open source. You can get the source code. Uh, bigger challenge is what do you do with third-party vendor-supplied software? who won't let you have access to the source code. Uh, the fact is you can at least analyze your customized code up to the interface to those vendor supplied systems. Uh, and, and obviously encourage your vendors to allow you or to, to perform it themselves to perform this kind of analysis so you know the, the weaknesses that you might have to deal with uh, in their software. In fact, mm -hmm. if I were acquiring software, I'd like for them to analyze it and show me the results so I'd know uh, if I'm going to pay them a license, what my risks are in accepting that license. Yeah, and I think he was also asking if there's any open source tools currently that are supporting the, the measures. I, I'm not aware that they have specifically decided to support the measures. Some of those open source tools have a number of the weaknesses in their in their collection. Sonar can do some of them, for instance. Uh, the fact is, a lot of these weaknesses are at the system level. You have to be able to analyze the entire system as a system, and that may be across multiple languages. That makes it a little bit more challenging uh, for a lot of the open source systems because they don't necessarily do multi-language integration uh, when, they're, when they're doing their analyses, uh, and then be able to track these things from the user interface down to the database. Uh, that, for a number of the weaknesses, especially in the area of security, that kind of a data flow analysis becomes fairly critical. And that's a more, uh, a little bit more sophisticated analysis than some of the open source tools have implemented. Yep. Thanks, Bill. Next question. Um, uh, who are the main stakeholders you think should sign this manifesto? What, what types of roles? Who should I seek out in my organization? Senior corporate executives. The folks that are that own the responsibility, uh, because this is how they communicate what they expect from IT or engineering. You know, if we if we're gonna if we're gonna commit the business to these, we we need to have policies and understand how we can reduce the risk to the business. Uh, and so, you know, obviously you want folks in IT, your architects, your CIS, and your chief information security officer, your CIO. But beyond that, we want folks in the senior executive suite because they ultimately are the people at risk. They're the ones that get the call from the newspapers when there's a major outage or a security breach. Uh, so it, this is really as much for them, it's for you know the development organizations to say, look, we understand these are things we need to do, but we need the executive team to say, look, we hold the organization as an organization responsible for ensuring these properties that we that we help reduce the risk that we are, you know, that we have to the business or to our customers. Right. So you had listed education <clears throat> as one of the principles. Are there any resources you recommend to to guide this you know, academic course material, uh, list of other courses? Well, there are, and I, you know, you can give a number of sources for security. You've got, you know, the folks at the Computer Emergency Response Team at the SEI produce materials. Uh, the SANS Institute, I believe, has has courses. Uh, so there's a number of sources for these kinds of uh, these kinds of things. Uh, for reliability, you know, most general software engineering uh, courses, once you get into more advanced courses, tend to talk about uh, principles for ensuring. The, uh, the reliability and, and performance of the system. Uh, but knowing about these weaknesses, I encourage you, we, we publish the CIS weaknesses, they're on the website, and I encourage you to learn more about those weaknesses and what what causes them, how you remediate them, uh, because that, that needs to be in the, the knowledge base of everyone who develops these 
these critical systems, whether business critical or mission critical. Uh, and so making sure they understand what those weaknesses are and how to avoid them becomes fairly critical. A lot of times these weaknesses get created in innocent ways. They just didn't really realize that the code they were implementing actually could contribute to one of these, especially system level weaknesses. Bill, it seems with DevOps, the responsibility for reliability <clears throat> is with the development team. Are you saying the responsibility needs to be with the CIO or above? Well, it, let's face it. Who, who's the, if the CEO gets called by the you know, by the newspapers, who is the first person the CEO is going to go seek out? The CIO. And who's the CIO going to seek out? The application manager. Who's the application manager going to seek out? The chief architect. Who's the chief architect going to say, you know, go down that list. All of those people have responsibility. Uh, the responsibilities differ based on your level. Uh, at the highest level, it's governance and risk management. At the lowest level, it's quality engineering work. Uh, it, you know, in QA, it's, it's trying to see you know, imagine all the possible things that can go wrong and all the bizarre thing, conditions the system can get hit with. Uh, you know, so all these people have different responsibilities, but everyone in that chain, from the people who are responsible for governance down to the people who implement the code, uh, have a responsibility. The operations people have responsibility, even though with DevOps, we're sort of mashing those more closely together. By the way, somebody's got to monitor. Somebody needs to monitor the system in operation, because you I, you know there you can start seeing things going in the wrong direction. You can see data being moved in ways that it shouldn't be moved. You can see behaviors in the system that are starting to predict a potential outage, uh, and so somebody needs to be monitoring this. Hopefully, automated monitoring, uh, but that's an, that's another responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then the last question we have here is. Um, <clears throat> about certification. Um, uh, we've talked about building out a certification program you know, as part of CISC roadmap. Um, is there a way to certify my software based on, on the, the CISC measures? Yes, the answer is yes. CISC itself doesn't do certifications, but what we do do is endorse uh, various static analysis products as capable of detecting the, the weaknesses in the CISC measures and, and producing the measures. Uh, so as some of the static analysis vendors come forward and ask for us to endorse them, we have an assessment process where we will assess their software and you know what proportion of the, uh, the weaknesses are able to detect. And if they're able to detect enough of them, uh, and there's, that's a, a growing number every year, uh, then we, we will endorse them. And then either that vendor or a service provider, you know, system integrator or outsourcer who uses that technology can provide a certification based on the application of a, of a an endorsed tech, CISC endorsed technology. Uh, and look, I mean, this, what's a certification for? The fact is that certification is valid until you make the first patch, because after you patch it, who knows what's going to happen. But what we're really doing with certification is providing, uh, you know, an, an act of due diligence. We're, we're showing that we are, in fact, tracking the trustworthiness of the software. And if it's at an unacceptable levels, we're requiring an action plan to remediate the most severe problem. So this is really something for managers and executives, especially executives, to show that we are do, do, doing due diligence by periodically certifying the state of trustworthiness in the software we're using in our products or to run the business. Mm -hmm. Another question came in. Um, <clears throat> are there any certification programs for security? Uh, there probably are some outside of CISC, uh, and but one of the one of the measures that could be used in certifying using the CISC uh, the CISC approach is our security measure. And you know, going to once we have endorsed technologies, going to one of the vendors who, in fact, has their security measure endorsed uh, would be able to provide that. Uh, I know that in the hardware domain, in the product domain, you're starting to see uh, people like the Underwriters Lab start to provide a level of certification for uh, embedded software inside of you know, various kinds of embedded products. Uh, so there are, there are sources of these things becoming available. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, well, we went through all the <clears throat> questions. Maybe give another moment in case there's one more <laughs> lingering question, but that was 
That's good. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you, and I thank all of you for attending. Uh, I encourage you to go to the website and look over the manifesto and consider signing it. But even more, I encourage you to get a copy and begin using it to talk to your your managers, your executives, especially your business executives, about the what you need to do to reduce the risk to the business of software intensive systems. So, with that, Tracy and I are thank you for attending, and we'll uh, we'll turn the rest of the hour back over to you. Good. Yeah, and if you want to check this afternoon, we'll be posting a video recording of the presentation today and the, the PDF if you want to uh, view this again or share with others. It'll be right on right on our site. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.